As I'm sure you guys have already noticed, this isn't going to be your typical BPS Customs video. Every once in a while, I think it's important to branch out a little bit into different areas of the tech space that are likely still relevant to a large portion of my audience. And I think most of you out there have at least a moderate interest in smartphones. Today, I take a look at five different devices from mobile technologies past and show you guys what my cell phone journey has looked like from then to now. Need a new home for your system? Check out the new Entermax Sabre Ray, an interchangeable front panel lets you choose between airflow or all show, while the spacious interior layout gives maximum flexibility and the option to mount a radiator on the back wall so you can show off your lighting. The top mounted IO features a convenient and easy way to change up the coloring on the vibrant RGB strips that span the entire exterior, and the PSU shroud and included lighting and fan control hub keep you in command. Check out the Sabre Ray at the link below. This idea actually came to me on Prime Day when I picked up this bad boy on a ridiculous deal. This is the Essential Phone, and it was on sale in the US for only $250 on Amazon, so I picked it up almost on a whim. I didn't necessarily need it as I am an iPhone user and I'm quite happy with my iPhone 10, but it has a really unique build to it. It feels great to hold because of the titanium and ceramic construction, and I haven't had the opportunity to mess around with an Android device in years. You see, back in the day, I was pretty heavily into the Android dev scene. Now, I wasn't a developer myself, but I was constantly on the lookout for new ways to improve my smartphone experience. I unlocked, rooted, and ROMed not only all of my devices, but also some for friends as well. And even though my desire to do so has definitely died down, I still remember those days fondly. When I took the essential phone out of the package, the first thing that popped into my mind was, how do I get Android P on this thing? And that got me thinking back to 10 or 11 years ago, back to the time when I got my first smartphone. And this is it, the LG Voyager or the VX 10,000. I got this phone as I made a huge change in my life, leaving the place that I'd lived since birth and moving down to Maryland. I got a place with my brother, started a new job, my long-term girlfriend and I broke up, and it was almost like a life reboot. This phone came out in 2007 and was marketed all over the place as an iPhone killer. I suppose most every Android phone back in those days was taking aim squarely at Apple's flagship, but this was the first product that I remember seeing that I thought looked legit. Because I was locked into a Verizon contract at the time and the iPhone wasn't AT&T exclusive for many years, I didn't have the option of switching over. But the Voyager certainly looked appealing, so I gave it a shot. Even though I'm classifying this as my first smartphone, I think in reality it's much more of a, a high-end feature phone than something that has actual smart capability. After all, it doesn't even have Wi-Fi, and many of the features you'd want a smartphone to have were actually replaced by non-removable Verizon proprietary apps. There was VZ Navigator instead of Google Maps. There was something called Vcast that streamed curated video content and news clips. And the web browser was awful compared to what you could find on a BlackBerry or Windows phone at the time. But the camera was serviceable and it sported two different screens. One resistive touch screen on the outside, as you can see, and a standard screen on the inside of the clamshell. The QWERTY keyboard layout on the interior was actually far superior to the controls on the touch screen for navigating around, and typing on it was actually pretty nice. Still though, I remained jealous of every single person who I saw with an iPhone, and I didn't think the LG Voyager was really on the same level. I then took a trip to Las Vegas to visit a friend of mine and spent maybe a week palling around doing stupid Vegas stuff. He was a BlackBerry rep at the time, and as a result, he had access to their entire product catalog. The phone he chose to use was this, the BlackBerry Pearl. I got to use it some and really enjoyed the slimmed down BlackBerry experience. 
as I wasn't a fan of their more chunky, wide devices of that era. When I got back home, I went out and bought one. The Pearl didn't have a touchscreen, but instead relied on this little trackball, which got itself clogged up with dust regularly. And I ended up having to disassemble this little ring housing maybe once every other week to clean it out. The keyboard provided excellent tactility, but was really small, especially with all the letters jammed onto tiny keys to fit inside the small body. Not to mention the fact that I do have relatively large hands. So although I got used to typing on it, I never really enjoyed the experience. The BlackBerry apps though were great. I had an actual serviceable navigation system and a web browser that didn't suck. I was also able to manage emails on here for the first time on a mobile device. It was pure heaven. Heaven, until that is, I saw what Motorola was doing with Android devices. They introduced this guy right here, the Motorola Droid in 2009, and it kind of changed the game. Again, the Droid was marketed as an iPhone killer, but this time those claims had some merit. The marketing campaign around this phone was Droid Does, which was in short a way of saying, this phone does all this stuff that iPhones don't. Now, this particular device was one that I unfortunately never owned. This one right here was my wife's that she gave to me a couple years ago, long after it became obsolete. And I kept it for nostalgia. But the phone that succeeded this one was the one that I upgraded to after the Pearl, and that's the Motorola Droid X. There's actually an interesting story that I'll always remember about this phone. When it was announced, Verizon and Motorola planned a midnight launch for July 15th, 2010. I was still rocking the Pearl, and by that time, the plastic housing was basically disintegrating in my hands. I fully planned on attending the midnight release and picking up what I thought was the most advanced mobile device that I had ever seen. I met my wife on a summer night in July of 2010, and although my memory, I guess, is maybe a little fuzzy about that time, I think it was on the 10th. After we met, we spent a few weeks texting or talking on the phone, and as I stood online outside of my local Verizon store at 11.45 p.m. on July 14th, I remember using my BlackBerry Pearl for the last time, trying to be as smooth as possible and trying to get Megan to come out and wait online with me. She, of course, refused as any reasonable person would, but we got married three years later anyway, so the story has a happy ending. In any event, the Droid X really started to put me down the path of rooting and roming. At the time, I thought this was an absolutely enormous phone, but comparing it to something like the iPhone 10 now, it actually looks fairly small. Still, it had an eight megapixel camera, a processor that ran at one gigahertz, and a crazy amount of connectivity compared to what I was working with before, including even a micro HDMI output on the side. The last phone I wanna talk about was my next Android device after the Droid X, and the first Nexus phone available on Verizon, the Samsung Galaxy Nexus. By the time this rolled out in November 2011, I was really hungering for that pure Android experience and fast upgrade rollout that users of the Nexus One and the Nexus S enjoyed. The Galaxy Nexus was the answer, and it slimmed down the body of the Droid X while doing something pretty unique curving the shape of the phone for a better fit against your head. It also was the first phone that I ever used that had no buttons and relied entirely on software navigation. I also really liked using live wallpapers as bad as that was for my battery life. After a while, I got really tired of the awful battery life on the Galaxy Nexus and moved on to the Nexus 5 in 2013. And from there, it's been all iOS. As I hopped onto the iPhone 6 bandwagon, I've been riding it ever since. But it's been fun breaking out these old devices and toying around with them a bit, as they are certainly tied to some great memories. And that's kind of what phones have become, right? They're so integral in our lives that we hardly go anywhere without them. And they become a part of our story, something we can look back on in a few years and pull bits of memories out just by glancing at the hardware. Although, they may never make a call or send a text again. That doesn't mean that they have no utility. They're just useful in a totally different way now. So what was your first smartphone? Let me know down below in the comments. Also, don't forget to get subscribed to the channel if you're not already. And as always, guys, thanks for watching.